Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here. In this unit, what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect meiosis to Mendel's principles. So this is gonna be a pretty strong rehashing of what we talked about in each of the past two videos. So in 4-1, I talked a lot about meiosis and in 4-2, I talked about Mendel's principles. And so I'm hoping to marry these two together in this video and show you how important it is. So for this, what I'm gonna do is I'll talk about the chromosome theory of inheritance. I will then discuss with you uh, the law of segregation and then the law of independent assortment and specifically how those connect to Mendel's laws. And then lastly, what we'll talk about is we will look at uh, the concept of gene linkage and how gene linkage uh, may lead to not quite uh, independent assortment or an exception to independent assortment. All right, so here we go. All right, so our chromosome theory of inheritance basically says that specific genetic material uh, is chromosomes, and that's where we're going to find the given alleles that we're looking for. So in this particular case, we're showing fruit flies, and the reason we're showing fruit flies is because fruit flies are one of the model organisms that were very crucial in the discovery of chromosome theory of inheritance, and uh, we can, we'll look at those in a few different instances throughout the year of how fruit flies are an important model organism. But in this particular instance, what we're looking at is on the top, we see what are referred to as wild type forms of genes. And these are genes that are a little bit more common in fruit fly populations. And along the bottom, we see mutant types, ones that we need to have two recessive alleles in order to show this. I don't love the idea that wild type is homozygous dominant because it gives this impression that the homozygous dominant is the one that is more common in the population. It is true for fruit flies, but it's not true of humans. So I just want to give a quick example of how that's not true in humans. Six-fingeredness is a dominant trait in humans, but obviously it is a trait with very low allele frequency within populations. So just because something is homozygous dominant doesn't mean it's more common. Allele frequency and being dominant recessive are totally unrelated. Back to the show on fruit flies. So what we can see here is you'll notice that we have our chromosome. And again, this is a chromosome that would have been after DNA replication because we see two chromatids here. We're going to focus in on the upper arm region and we're going to pull that down and we'll see that there are specific loci or locations given for specific genes. So that first gene appears to be something having to do with the antenna. We have um, wild type being a larger bristled antennas as opposed to shorter antennas along the bottom. We can see that there's a wing difference at 13, a loci of 13 along this arm. We see that there's a leg length difference around 31. We see body color is changed at uh, 48.5. We see a change in eye color there at 54.5. Again, we see at 67 and at 75.5, we see two different wing shapes. Looks like maybe a vestigial wing and then a curly O wing possibly. And then in the last location, we see eye color again coming up at 100. 104.5 uh, wild type red eye versus a sepia eye loci there. And so what we see here, are these are specific locations in there. So if I was to focus in on this DNA, what I would find is the A's, T's, C's, and G's within the DNA that code for these specific traits. And now whether or not the fly would end up having a large antenna versus a shorter antenna would depend on what the series of A's, T's, and the C's and G's occurred on there. And in the case of having, say, shorter hairs, I would need to have all of the DNA sequences for the chromosomes, or maybe both sets of the chromosomes, being the DNA sequence that produces short bristles. If one of the two parents passed on a, a large bristles or large antenna onto this offspring, we would end up seeing the wild type form those larger bristles. This is tying the specific alleles to locations on the chromosomes. Those locations are called a loci or a locus if I talk about singular. All right, so now uh, I wanna pause and think here and I wanna ask you the question, when does segregation occur during meiosis? should know what segregation is from uh, previous videos or readings. So I want you to pause and think and, and figure out where during this case would you see segregation occurring? Pause and think. All right, so what you should have come up with is the idea that segregation is the separation of the big A from the little a. So let's say I have this parent and they are... Um, in this particular instance, we're going to say that they are a heterozygous um, 
for the trait, that A trait. So we'll call the A trait in this case uh, large bristles. And they're heterozygous for large bristles. And so that means they're going to have one uh, big A and they're going to have one little A. So when do the big A and the little A separate? Well, that's going to occur during meiosis one. And that's when the homologous chromosomes are going to be pulled apart um, as we go from diploid to haploid. So that's the primary time. Now, if what you did notice is that, like, well, wait a minute, what if they were on these shorter upper arms, these ones that underwent crossing over and synapses, um, in that instance, I might have, little, we'll make a gene B, and so I might actually have both big B and little b on these two chromosomes here. I'm not actually going to see the segregation of those alleles until I get into meiosis two. That would be an exception, but it would be an astute ex uh, exception that occurs. So we could make the rule that without synapsis, segregation always occurs after meiosis one. And if there is synapsis, it is possible that you don't truly get segregation until uh, the end of meiosis two. If you were pressed and you were asked like when does segregation occur, uh, when you have reduction division at the end of meiosis one would be um, an acceptable answer. Again, with the exception of if synapsis was to have messed it up somehow. All right, so now let's think about independent assortment. So again, I want you to pause and think, and maybe I'll go back to the, the, the previous diagram, or I could actually just keep it here, but I'll ask you the question, when does independent assortment occur? Pause and think. All right, so if you think about independent assortment, independent assortment is, the fact that the big A is going to assort independently of the big B, and that there's an equal chance that you'll get a big A and a big B, or a big A and a little b, when you end up having the gametes. The true time of this is going to be the same as in the previous diagram. So maybe I should go back and show you that. So again, looking back here, if we look at these and I look at the, the alleles and I'm going to put them all on separate chromosomes. So I'm going to make the big uh, chromosomes have A's on them and I'm going to have the little chromosomes have B's on them. Depending on how these line up as I separate them at the end of meiosis one, as I do the reduct reduction division, there's a chance that I could pass on big A and big B or I might have passed on a big A with a little b. So obviously on the bottom, I could have had a little a with a little b or a little a with a big b. And so again, the lining up and the random separation of these chromosomes that happens at the end of meiosis one is gonna be the time in which independent assortment occurs, specifically and particularly if the alleles are on separate chromosomes. Well, what happens if they're on the same chromosome? If they're on the same chromosome, what we end up seeing here is the example that I had here, and that we can actually get as early as synapses is when they start to shuffle up. Again, similar to what we saw in segregation, that with crossing over, it's not really until I pull apart, in this case, those two purple chromatids, uh, and I do the final step of separating these out to their own independent gametes, that I'm actually going to get the true uh, independent assortment. So again, the end of meiosis two. So hard pressed, when does independent assortment occur? End of meiosis one, excellent answer, um, especially if the alleles are on separate chromosomes. When does independent assortment occur if there is crossing over that occurs? Well, that independent assortment may not actually occur until the end of meiosis two and we form those gametes, or at least the completion of that process. All right, on to our last step, which is the concept of gene linkage. So as we looked at this diagram earlier, we saw that there's these fruit flies with these different loci along this chromosome. And the idea here is that if I have two loci, so let's talk about my two locations that are on the extremes in this diagram, my uh, antenna length and my red eye versus CPI. These two locations or loci are really, really far apart. There are 104 map units, um, 104.5 map units to be specific. They are uh, going to assort independently, which means that crossing over is going to come along and it's going to pull apart the very 
upper tip of this and this point that's much farther away from the tip, it's going to happen pretty regularly. It's going to have an equal chance of happening as if these were on separate chromosomes. In other words, if I had an individual that was heterozygous for these two traits, for the antenna and for the eye color, these would assort completely independently because crossing over would happen enough that I would end up shuffling these out. Again, assuming these are on the same chromosome, which they are here, I would get true independent assortment when I finished that whole process of producing gametes, and I would have an equal likelihood of having large bristles uh, and red eyes as large bristles with sepia eyes and short bristles with uh, red eyes and short bristles with sepia eyes. Equal opportunity, I would have true independent assortment. Now let's take a couple of traits that are not quite like that. So let's look at the traits of long legs versus short legs and a light body versus a dark body. These two loci are only 17.5 napians apart. And so you'll notice this location is not very big. And so the likelihood that crossing over or synapses is going to occur goes way, way, way down. And so what we find is that when you have two locations on a chromosome, two loci on a chromosome uh, that are really close together, those genes do not assort independently. You are more likely to pass them on as a package. So if we think of the fact that we had an original wild type of parent um, and an original um, mutant type parent that we had crossed to produce our heterozygotes, that means that long legs and light body would be on one set of chromosomes and short legs and dark body would be on the other side of cr short chromosome. The fly that has those two sets of alleles would have the longer legs and would have the light body. But what we would find is that we're not going to cross them over, and that means that we're going to find flies that show long legs and light bodies and would find ones with short legs and dark bodies. They would actually occur more often, and combinations of these two, meaning long legs and dark bodies or short legs and light bodies would actually occur much less. You're not going to produce those new recombinant crossed over chromosomes very often, and so therefore the offspring are not going to show that true independent assortment. If you think back to our example in a previous unit, we talked about that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. You would not expect a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio if there are linked genes. Or more appropriately, if you expect to get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio and then you end up looking at the offspring and you don't end up seeing that, one of the questions you might ask yourself is, are these two genes on the same chromosome? Are they possibly linked? And then you might actually study that. And that's how we've discovered most of the linked genes that we see in the sample problems that we would look at. We're not going to give you a lot of problems with this. It's just one of those things that you should be aware of that not all genes actually behave in a true independent assortment, especially if they fall in this case on the same chromosomes and close together on that chromosome. All right, I hope that was helpful to everybody and I'll talk to you soon.